of like live dialogue to identify and connect with all the needs that were present for them. And it looks like there is no solution. They either go to the mosque or they don't go to the mosque. How can it work for everybody? And through very careful connection with all the needs and slowing the process down until everybody was on board holding all the needs, the strategy emerged. It was very carefully crafted. They were put in some particular piece in the mosque that wouldn't interfere with anything else. There was a uh, curtain around them or whatever. I don't even know what all the details were, but they, they were together crafting the strategy. So the energy that goes into defending and protecting gets transformed into a well of possibility that we put together into creating something that we know together will work for both of us. You wanted to say something? Is it still? Yeah. yeah. I saw in Kamisa, uh, in an online conference last weekend. And what was really powerful was his connection that young people today don't have any uh, right of passage. They don't have a connection that says a 14-year-old boy um, in order to get into the game had to shoot his son and was actually killed his son. And it really made me think that um, Native American traditions and as the youth go out in the wilderness, that's like an interconnectedness and a coming of age ceremony. But there is that in our society. I think young people need that. So, so you, you look, you're trying to imagine what it is that goes on in our society that creates that disintegration of sense of community. And one of the possibilities that you're proposing is creating rituals or, or, or ways of marking life that allow people to feel their interconnectedness, one of which is rites of passage. There are many ways that people can experience their interconnectedness. If that is a goal that people have, it's very easy to find ways. And the, the, the counterpart of interconnectedness is self-connection. We're also not brought up to be connected with ourselves. We're brought up, you know, here's just one example. You're, you're still fairly close to being raised, maybe you remember more than some older people do. Do you remember often being asked by your parents or teachers how you feel and what you need? Is that a common memory of yours? Yes? I'm, I'm just, you, you, were, you, you were asked how you feel and what you need often? Lucky one. <laughs> Raise your hand if you were often frequently regularly asked what it is that you want, what matters to you in your school and at home. Boy, there's some lucky people. In most of the audiences that I speak to, there's hardly anyone. It's, you know, this is interesting. It is interesting because um, in, in a research that was done about who saved Jews in the Holocaust, one of the things that they found is that the people who saved Jews tended to come from non-punitive households. And it makes total sense because if you come from a non-punitive household, you're going to be less fearful. And if you're less fearful, you have more access to checking inside what matters to me, what are my real values. Yeah, Matthias. I, I'm wondering, um, I mean, non-violent communication is a pretty simple concept. However, it's very hard often to apply because we're not so clear what really what our emotions, you know, we, we use all this language basically that's around mm -hmm. us in TV and mm -hmm. just how we talk. So I'm wondering if you, if you were to give some examples of really how to communicate and how, you know, identify some feelings. And just because we say, I feel, it doesn't mean that we actually talk mm -hmm. about feeling and say, I feel like you're, you know, a jerk. A jerk, right? <laughs> and, and Take like, it off the webcam. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, I'm not used to, yeah, we can bleep it out. Yeah. I know it's time, I'm wondering if, if uh, you could actually give some examples of how yeah. you facilitate some Sure. Um, uh, why don't we, uh, somebody come up with an example of a conflict. Let's make it simple, not like some big uh, international conflict, but something small from your own life. Yeah. They want to be more involved. Yes. Okay. And you don't. Well, and for us, on our perspective, I'm just so imagining all this stuff is happening, so we're not really feeling anything right now. But they still feel disconnected. So if we're having a breakdown and like trying to communicate with them, we're not doing anything about them. <laughs> but they still are feeling that. Okay, that's a very simple one. So um, the the key here, my guess is that they are saying something like, We want to be more involved. Why aren't you involving us? And you say in response, because we're not doing anything. So what is not happening, unless there's something that I'm not hearing because you're telling me only a little bit, what I don't hear happening is hearing them. Just being able to hear them. So often, the first step of a, of a nonviolent dialogue is to hear the other person and what they want. So, um, would you be your in, uh, if your fiance's parents, your future in laws? Pick one of them and be, be that person for a moment. Yeah. Are you, is, is, that, is that really with your willingness or are you uncomfortable? To be, so it doesn't matter because so it doesn't even have to be accurate, it's just yeah. for modeling purposes. Okay. So, one of the things that happened was that they asked. Just be, just be, and, and so do it. I ask me. So, I will be your fiance. Okay. You know, you really need to do that in ceremony, and you need, maybe he needs to walk down the aisle, and you need to really make sure that he's involved, and you need to make sure that all of his needs are met. Okay. So, the first thing that I might want to do in a moment like this is connect with myself inside. Because when somebody tells me you need to, you have to, remember what we said? My autonomy buttons are pushed to the max. So first thing that I can do is give myself a little bit of empathy inside, silently. And it might look like, phew, this is really hard. I am just so longing to be trusted and to have the autonomy to make my own choices about what my wedding is going to look like. I so much want that. And somehow in recognizing that and naming it inside, there's a little bit more space because I've connected to myself. I'm not in reactive mode, connected to myself. And then I can come back and hear. Okay, so what does my sister want? She, what does she want? What matters to her? Apart from the strategy of that does this or that or the other, what is it at the core? What basic human need of the ones that we've named is on the table for her? I think so. hmm? She wants to be heard. Yeah. Okay, I'm about to do that. What is it that she wants to be heard about? What are the needs that live there? Yeah. She wants connection. Any other, any other needs that you're picking up? Participation. Participation. The word we used before was belonging. Belonging, inclusion. So I'll pick one. <coughs> and in this moment, the one that, that kind of like speaks to me, and I always can only follow my own intuition until I've made the connection. So, sister, I, I kind of get it, and I just want to check with you. Is it that you really want to be included in this event? Yes. <laughs> so I know that you're just playing a role, but tell me, how did it feel to hear this? Um, okay, I haven't agreed to anything. <laughs> one of the keys, <laughs> yeah, one of the keys to being able to be empathic is to separate understanding from agreement. 
We tend to mix the two. We tend to think that we understand someone if we agree with them, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's so. And if we disagree with someone, we will hold back understanding. <coughs> As if understanding, if I show understanding, it means that I agree. Because we live in the agree-disagree paradigm. The agree-disagree paradigm is the paradigm of separation. It's the same paradigm with right and wrong. Oh, yeah. That is coercion versus persuasion. Uh -huh. So instead, I want to focus on understanding. Now, that experience of being validated will now give her a little bit more space. Just like I had space in me from empathizing with myself, now she has a little bit more space. It may require a couple more rounds of, of, of reflecting until she you know, really settles enough to hear me. Now, if I speak to her, there's going to be more room for her to hear me. So, um, but I'm not confident yet that it has settled enough because I heard a lot of charge. So you said yes. So, so I, I, I'm guessing that you're really happy about this marriage and you want to have a sense of connection with it. Don't guess her response. Just give it as it's coming from you right now. Um, yes, I think that you guys are coming together and it will be fun to marry. So now what, what is happening is I am now hearing something that is sweet for me to hear. Instead of hearing somebody intruding and stepping on me, I am now connecting with her joy about my marriage. It's much more fun. <laughs> much, much, much more fun. Yeah, what? Yeah, it is much easier to connect with one person's feelings and needs than with their ideas about other people's feelings and needs. Now, if it was, if you were insisting, no, it's not about me. You know, why are you making it be about me? I would say so. So it's more that you just want the whole family to be included, but it's still you wanting. I'm just trying to connect with the energy of what it is that you want, because when you get hurt about what you want, you calm down. So then, what I want to express, here's what I might like to express. I'm, I'm going to jump ahead because very soon I'm going to be kicked out of this room. So, uh, sister, I, here's what I want to convey to you. First of all, I'm really touched to hear of your uh, joy and. <laughs> Thank you. Of your joy and, and happiness for us, and, and I, I really experience a sense of support from that. And then I want to convey to you my real confusion and dilemma. I don't know what to do. I'm happy to, you know, think strategically about how to include you later when we start working. Right now, um, you know, my, my fiance is focused on her studies. We're not doing anything. And I want to know if you trust what I'm saying. I trust what you're saying, but I feel that you might not think about these things unless I just <coughs> Ah, so now I'm connecting with something completely different. It's not about inclusion. Now it's about something else. So you have a little bit of worry because you really want this event to go smoothly. Yeah, I don't want people to feel left out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we continue. Th is that what you were hoping to see? <laughs> so as long as I am able to easily flow between expressing what is in my heart and checking in with her about what is in her heart, we will converge, converge towards connection. And it will take less time than you imagine if you can really stay unprotected and curious. If I'm protecting myself, less of me will be available to connect with you. Martin Buber defined dialogue as a conversation with an unknown outcome. And I love this definition, it's so simple, and it really points to the fact that most of the conversations that we have, somebody could guess what each person would say. And a large part of it is because when we start the conversation, we have an attachment to what the outcome has to be. So when you, I know that you have not been involved in these conversations, but maybe your fiance, when he's talking with his sister or with his, anybody in his family, he starts that conversation with an already, it's a fait complete that you're not going to be involved until I'm ready for you to be involved. That's a closed heart, in a way. Sister starts the conversation from, I'm going to be involved now. That's a clash. If I persist in maintaining a position, it's going to be harder for me to connect with you. If I can really truly let go of outcome and be available to the dialogue, to be affected by what you say, to be affected by what your feelings and needs are, then I might be changed. If I'm not willing to be changed by our dialogue, on what grounds am I asking you to be changed? And so often we go into a conversation, even with a lot of nonviolence training, even with a lot of dialogue skills, ultimately wanting the other person to change, wanting the other person to hear us. Why would they want to do that if it's one-sided? I want to come in equally willing for me to be changed, equally willing for me to come out of the dialogue, going along with your strategy instead of mine, because we're connected. Thank you. I want to. I want to conclude with um, one of many stories about my nephew, who has been raised using this system from day one. And and then do what you asked me to do, which is to talk about the scope of the work. So, a couple of years ago, when he was about six, my sister was going to go with him somewhere, and they had half an hour before uh, their time to go. And he started doing something, and then she remembered that there was an errand that she could run on the way. And I know that most of you, maybe all of you, have not been parents, but parents, combining errands is, is like great, great boon. So she goes to him and she says, I know that you just started doing this thing, and I just remember this thing that we could do on the way, and I really would like to do it. Are you willing to complete what you're doing sooner so that we could leave earlier? Watch the difference between that and the normal parenting paradigm of, you know, I changed my mind, we're leaving now. And then he says, I, d I really have a preference for completing because I'm really engaged in it, and I don't, so I, I would rather not go now. And it was not a big deal for her, so she said, okay, no, no problem, so we'll leave at the original time. And she starts walking away, and then he calls after her, are you sure? I want it to work for you too. Now that is because he has trust that his needs matter. And when he has trust that his needs matter, there's more room in him to care about her needs. So that's one story. Are any of you parents? No. There have been parents in previous years sometimes. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, um, I want to, um, and I want to pass these things out um, as we are finishing, but please uh, don't try to read them now. 
because I've, I've, you'll, you'll have them later. It's an article that I wrote that was published in Tikkun, actually, a couple of years ago, and uh, just an introductory handout that contains kind of like in condensed form all the information about nonviolent communication. So the scope of the work here locally, we have uh, trainings that happen just about every day of the week. There's something going on. The only place in the Bay Area where there is more nonviolent communication classes than in our office is San Quentin. We have a project of bringing these skills to um, people in San Quentin, which is very, very exciting. Um, internationally, this process is now taught in, I think, 40 or 50 countries. There are more than 200 trainers like me that are certified around the world and untold number of people who are just teaching it without being certified. Um, and um, people, we do public workshops with trainers all over the world, public workshops, NGO training. A former student of mine it lives in Sri Lanka. She's originally from Sri Lanka, and she travels around Sri Lanka and teaches it, including to members of the Nonviolent Peace Force, including she's Tamil, including she's teaching in mixed groups of Tamils and Sinhala. And it's very exciting to see what is possible, even in the midst of great rifts. And many other places in the world, both public sector, private sector, public workshops, conflict resolution, uh, attempts at a different form of restorative justice, and various other things like that. And uh, the last thing that I want to say before parting is if any of you are interested in internships, and uh, have been uh, interested in what you heard today, then uh, come talk to me for a few minutes. Thank you very much. This was a total pleasure being with you.